Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture of the Kiskin Global Summer School. I am your host and lecturer, Zlatko Minev, and I hope you are as thrilled and as excited as I am to be here today with you, because we are about to get more real about quantum computing and how to use real quantum computers, as well as what you need to know about them. Now, I'm particularly excited to be here today with you because I know you've dedicated two weeks of your life in the summer to be part of this uh, amazing global summer school. And that's why I know we'll have a lot of fun, we'll learn a lot, and we'll go pretty far on our journey together. Today, our aim is really to help give you the skills and know-how to explore the world of quantum computing and its applications. Thanks to students from previous summer schools, we now also have a very nice typed up lecture set of notes that goes along with this lecture so you can follow along and we'll try to provide those to you along with the rest of this lecture. So thank you to the students of previous years, some of whom have helped in the work in transcribing these and we welcome all feedback on it as well as help. So with that, let's get right into it. Together we will answer the following question. What do you need to know before putting theory into practice on a real noisy quantum processor. Our focus will be on the big ideas first, which I will illustrate through concrete and manageable and tangible examples. We will start very simple with the basics, repeat some of what you've already seen in the previous lectures, but we will go far. As we go along, please do post questions in the chat and we will try to answer those and have a discussion and get to them in the Q&A period. So with that, let's get into a traditional way to begin, which is a hello world example, but this time with a real quantum computer. Here you see the cartoon sketch of a quantum computer. One kept inside a superconducting fridge, shown here, and there's some friendly friends working on the fridge to maintain it. Now, inside this fridge is housed the qubit. At the level of today's lecture, we're really going to abstract away all of the details of what that qubit is, how it's made, etc., etc. Really, we'll just need to know that it's a ball or a sphere and it has an arrow going through it, and we'll get a little more technical soon. But if you're interested in diving into the details of how qubits are made, what they are, you can go back to one of our earlier superconducting qubit lectures to learn about that. For now, it suffices to say that all we need to know is that a qubit has two computational basis states, conventionally labeled as zero and one, placed inside this ket notation, this vertical line with the little bracket, as you've learned already, to denote that they are quantum states, not classical states, and henceforth different. To manipulate quantum information, to do something to these states and to this qubit, we need operations, such as this qubit gate. The simplest non-trivial thing you can do is to take the qubit and its state, let's say it's zero, and to flip it into one. And if you applied that operation again, you'd flip one back into zero. So this is the not gate or the X gate as you learned from John in the first few lectures of the summer school. Simple and symmetric. Now, in addition to quantum operations, we will also need a way to extract data out of the quantum computer. And so here you have our quantum to classical interface, uh, the measurement box or measurement apparatus, simply here depicted with this symbol. And it tells us that it measures in a particular basis, which we will call the Z basis. And that's the operator complementary to the bit flip operator. We call this the phase flip operator as it flips the phase of zero and one, something that doesn't immediately have a classical bit analog. Now, imagine that we wanted an algorithm where we could give you an integer, and given that integer, you'd, your quantum computer would tell you if it's even or odd. So how could we design such an algorithm? Well, one way to do that is to say, give me an integer d, I will take the qubit and I will flip it d times using my NOT gate. And if I flipped it an even number of times, I'll get one answer. If I flipped it an odd number of times, I'll get an 
different answer, and that's one way to classify the difference between even and odd integers. So let's see how this kind of qubit flipper algorithm for our hello world buildup example will look like. One way is to, to do it is the following. Let's say you start in the zero state, and if your integer d is zero, you just measure. If your integer d is one, you simply apply the not gate one time. If your integer d is two, you apply the not gate two times. If your integer d is three, you apply the not gate three times, and so and so on. And we like to sometimes refer to this progression as depth of the circuit since there are more and more gates. Let's analyze the circuit. At step zero, you see that all the states of the qubit are always in the ground state, in the zero state. After we apply the first layer of not gates, we must have flipped the qubit. So the qubit must be in the excited or one state. Now, in the first case, if we measured uh, immediately the qubit, as John uh, showed us how to determine answers out of outcomes out of quantum channels, you'll see that the measurement will yield a value of plus one for the expectation value of what we call the qubit z operator. And if we flip the qubit just once, being putting it in the excited state or the one state, we will see that the expectation value of the outcome or the bit we will get out in this case is going to be minus one. And if, of course, if you go on, you'll see that our result will simply alternate to from plus one to minus one, plus one to minus one, given the depth of the circuit. And so if we wanted to be a bit more mathematical about it, we could take the following formula. We could say the expectation value of the qubit z operator as a function of the circuit depth d is simply an alternating function of plus one and minus one. So what does this look like? Pictures are worth a thousand words. And here we can say that as a function of the circuit depth from zero to a hundred, our value will merely alternate from minus one to plus one, indicating whether the integer is classified as even or odd. So this is all great. We've designed our first hello world quantum algorithm. Let's run it on a real quantum device. Now, I challenge you to try this in Qiskit yourself and see what you get and share with us the results of flipping our qubit up and down. Okay, so this is what I got when I ran this on a real quantum device. Not exactly what we saw on the previous slide of just pure plus ones and minus ones. What you see here is that, well, you know, it still kind of looks the right at short times, at short depth. But as time, as depth increases, we see that the signal seems to decay. There's a lot of fluctuations on top of it. It even goes to zero at one point, but then it comes back and it seems to oscillate and decay and just have a lot of noise on top of it. So what happened to our beautiful quantum algorithm where we were going to solve the world's problems? Well, this situation may remind you of a joke. Your quantum computer is broken in every way possible simultaneously instead of simultaneously processing your quantum information. And I'm reminded of a quote by the famous physicist Asher Perez. Quantum phenomena do not occur in the Hilbert space. They occur in a laboratory. It's important to keep that in mind, that real experiments don't occur in this abstract space. They occur in the real world with real imperfections. And it's necessary and unavoidable that things won't work out quite how we expect, does that mean we should abandon all hope and give up? No. We can begin to understand what the challenges are, what the issues are due to what we will call noise, unwanted things in our system, and how to overcome them, and how to get better results, how to extend the computational reach of the quantum computer. So that's what this lecture is going to dive into. Because noise causes these errors, errors corrupt calculations, corrupted calculations are untrustworthy. But that's not the end of the story. We can overcome them, that noise in some way. Your classical computer, your phone, your, they all have noise, but they overcome them in certain ways. And so we will begin our journey to understand and then overcome noise. Let's look at this 
experimental data curve we just got. You notice that first of all, even at depth zero, without any gates, we don't exactly get what we are supposed to get. You see, we are not quite at one, we're a little bit below, and that's going to be related to what we call state preparation and measurement noise, also known as spam. We physicists like to be cute. Then, you see that the overall shape of the curve, the Ks, and that is very characteristic. You will see this all the time in all kinds of exper in every experiment you do, you'll get this kind of decay. This is energy decay. It's phase decoherent. Let's not get into the terms yet. For now, all we need to know is that it's some kind of process which we call incoherent. And this is a very characteristic empirical observation of incoherent noise. You also see that in addition to the decay, there's an oscillation. And that is characteristic of the more traditional operations in quantum physics we're familiar with, such as coherent noise, or coherent operations, unitaries. And we'll refer to those as coherent noise. And finally, you see that even at long time, when all the signal has decayed, it doesn't mean even the noise is gone. We still see this fluctuations on top of the signal, and that's related to both state preparation and measurement noise, SPAM for short, as well as the projection noise which is intrinsic to quantum physics, as we'll get to see. And so I'm excited to tell us that on our road ahead, we're going to jump right into coherent noise first. Then we'll unravel quantum measurements and what they mean and how we bridge the quantum to classical divide to get information out and what are some of the fundamental limitations there, which will lead us into imperfect meters measurement apparatus, as well as imperfect state preparation. Then we'll go into the final chapter on incoherent noise, which is going to get a little more advanced, but we'll give you the main ideas and dive into the specifics. There's a little bit of bonus content I'll share with you in some extra PDFs that should be attached along with your lecture on more advanced noises and things to worry about. And finally, in the following lecture, our next lecture, we'll talk about as we will begin to show the outlook towards, how do you overcome noise now that we know it? Understand and then overcome. Okay, folks, time to get into it. Now, before we dive in, let's introduce some of the characters we'll see along the way. There's going to be a lot of evil monsters in this lore. Uh, they're going to represent the noise, and they're here to uh, make our life a bit more interesting. Then there's going to be a lot of randomness that comes in through this whole lecture, so this will be our symbol for it. Main results and challenges are in these boxes. And then you can try, I'm going to pause, or rather ask you to pause the video and try things before I show you the results, because it's very important to get that hand-on experience if you really want to master this material. And then I'll give you a few dangerous bend signs. This means that this is extra material that you can jump into and learn, but it's probably not worth doing on a first pass. It's more of a second pass of the material or is more advanced. And finally, common pitfalls and cautions. So hopefully these guideposts will help make your journey smoother. All right, so jumping into coherent noise. Let's return to the original example of Hello World and really expand our cartoonish picture of the spin over here into an actual uh, picture of the block sphere. Um, this is a picture, a depiction, a representation of what the state of the quantum system can be. For now, it suffices to say, as Olivia showed you in the last lecture, that our quantum state is going to be an arrow that points somewhere on this sphere. Here, the red arrow, showing that our qubit is in the ground state. And we'll try to understand the dynamics of this first experiment through the lens of the block sphere, first pictorially, and then diving more and more into equations to complement and, and uh, allow us to generalize. So, try this yourself. I'm going to give you two problems, pause the video, try to work them out yourself, given what you've already learned in the previous lectures. First, show that for the zero state, 
The expectation value of the poly z, x, and y operators are 1, 0, and 0, respectively. And that's exactly going to represent what this red arrow here is. So effectively, just try to work out how you would show that that is the block vector comprising the x, y, z components, like this. And secondly, where does the one state lie? Show that for the one state, the x, y, z block components are 0, 0, minus 1, respectively. So they're antipodal on the block sphere. So pause the video, try to work this out yourself. OK, I hope you tried it, and now you're back. We won't dive too much into the detail of this, but I'd like to show you the flavor of how you would have approached this problem to solve it. Well, first, you can write out the three matrices for the poly, z, x, and y components, which were introduced earlier in these lectures. And you can also remember that the matrices representing the zero state and the one state are these two. Where it gets a little more subtle is to remember what the dual, which we like to say, or the bra, um, this element right here is. It's what we like to call the adjoint or conjugate transpose of the zero. So you take the matrix, you turn it sideways, you transpose it, and then you conjugate it, complex conjugate. Since everything is real in zero and one, there's not anything to do with the conjugation. It effectively amounts to just a transpose. So now you have one matrix which is vertical, one which is horizontal. Then to calculate the expectation value of the poly z operator, you sandwich it between the bra and the ket, meaning the horizontal and the vertical vectors. You can recall we already knew or had shown that you can work this out using the matrices or using the algebra where you can show that the z operator will give you the, the plus one value if your state is zero and it will give you the minus one value if the state coming in is one. These are eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And so you can from here show, recalling by the way that the overlap, the inner product between two, the same state and itself is one. These are normalized states as John and Olivia had shown you. You can show that this is one. And similarly, you can do this for the X operator. In this case, however, the X operator is going to act on the zero state and flip it to the one state. And then the inner product or the overlap between zero and one is zero. And you can show this using the matrices or using the algebra. And finally, you can repeat this game for the Y operation, recalling that Y is going to flip your spin like the X operator. However, it's also going to add this extra imaginary face. Here, it doesn't really matter, and we won't need to think about it because it anyway goes to zero since the overlap between one and zero is zero. Good. So if you have any questions about this, post them in the chat. Feel free to answer each other's questions, or we can bring them up in the Q&A. Now let's dig into the evolution of the block sphere. First, let's do this pictorially. Initially, our state, shown with this red arrow, starts pointing north. And then as we apply our not operation, it has to somehow traverse or make its way down to the south pole. How can it do that? Well, it can't just instantaneously flip if we actually think about the physical process by which this happens. Instead, it has to follow some kind of continuous smooth trajectory from one side of the pole to the other, just like how you can't just start at the North Pole of Earth and show up at the South Pole. You kind of have to traverse your way around it. And let's say that it took this uh, rotation along the surface of the block sphere from zero to one. And we're going to explore the math of this operation in a second because that's the operation by which the gate occurs and will be important to understand the noise in it. Next, we have two not operations. Well, what would have happened here is that our qubit started in the North Pole. It rotated down to the South Pole. Then it got rotated all the way back up to the North Pole. You might be wondering why there is this black arrow pointing this way. And that's going to, as you see, represent the direction around which we're rotating. That has to do with the X gate. 
And that's what we'll dive into next to show with a few equations. So how do you implement this X gate to begin with? It doesn't just show up. One way to implement the X gate is by subjecting the qubit to a rotation around X. You've seen a little bit about Hamiltonians and Schrodinger's equation and time evolution. And in this section, we're going to briefly play with them and show you how they actually give rise physically to our gates. So here we have um, the Hamiltonian defined as Planck's constant h bar times omega, some kind of constant, you know, an angular rate divided by 2 times our bit flip operator. You notice here I dropped the hat on our X gate. It's still a quantum operator, but we'll get a little more familiar with our notation. So you don't need to always write the hats on top. So as a matrix, it looks like this. Next, as you've seen earlier, the way that a Hamiltonian gives rise to time evolution, where T denotes the amount of time, is by taking that Hamiltonian and exponentiating. And this is the solution to the Schrodinger equation, in other words, this exponential. And we call U the unitary. And so the unitary, the way that the total state will actually rotate, is given by this. We can define the angle of the rotation, I'll call it theta, here as the product of omega and t. And you see that t comes in from the unitary evolution and omega comes in from the strength of our Hamiltonian. Now, what you notice is that this u, we can write down, as we'll show why this is true in a second, as a rotation r around the axis x, that's what this will mean, of an angle theta. And we write it like this. There's a factor of 2 here, as we'll see, because the actual angle by which we'll rotate on the block sphere is actually going to be theta. Now, I challenge you to try to expand and show why this rotation is equivalent to the following. And perhaps this is where you can remember that the x operator itself, when squared, is going to give you the identity. Remember that x is um, 0, 1, 1, 0. So try to work out how for this operation, x squared, you're going to get out the identity operation. And then you'll see that x cubed has to be x again. Let's make sure we know that these are quantum. So if you use this logic again and again, showing that x to the power of n is going to be equal to the identity each time that n is uh, even, and each time n is odd, it's just going to return itself. Use that in conjunction with the Taylor expansion for the exponential and try to separate out the terms since that expansion is going to have powers of n. And from there you can show that half those terms will contribute only identities and if you combine all of the classical coefficients of the Taylor series before that, you recognize that that gives you the cosine. And on the other hand, if you combine all of the coefficients on that have to go with the x term, that's going to give you this term that is proportional to sine of theta over 2. So in other words, our rotation looks like it's going to apply to our state the identity operation weighed by some cosine, which you notice is, has value 1 for angle 0. And it's going to apply some bit flipping, some x, with some phase related here to i and this sign. If the angle is 0, this whole term here is 0 for um, theta equals to 0. So you notice how for the angle theta equals to 0, this rotation is simply going to be the identity. We didn't do anything. Now, let's see one other little piece here of uh, importance, which is that we can show that 
let's go back actually and show this here first. Notice we did the angle theta zero. What about the angle theta equals pi? At theta equals pi, you notice that Rx of theta equals pi, excuse me, is going to equal, well, zero minus i uh, sine of pi over two times x. And so this is something that's proportional to x, right? Um, in fact, it's exactly minus i x. So we have exactly the bit flip operator x with a phase. This phase is known as a global phase in this case, since it only acts to the overall unitary, which means it will only act to the overall wave function. And as John uh, introduced in his earlier lectures, that means that that's something we can for now ignore. It doesn't want to affect any of the results here that we will look at and measure. So we say that this rotation around the x poly of an angle pi is equivalent to an x gate. We call that a pi pulse up to a global phase. It's this rotation that you saw as an angle of theta that is exactly determining our rotation along the block sphere. So as you increase the angle theta, you start at the North Pole and you see how we slowly evolve um, here color coded in these arrows for the phase from the North Pole down to the South Pole. And exactly at angles zero and at angles pi, we either leave the state alone or we flip it. If we applied this uh, rotation twice, or if we increase the angle to uh, two pi, you notice that now we've simply rotated this vector all the way back to where it started, although up to a global phase, but we can ignore that. Great, so that's how the gates work. Now, let's use that to understand how a noisy gate works. Now imagine that um, as an experimentalist, your job is to tune up this angle theta. In other words, your job is to tune up the total time that you've allowed the interaction, that you've driven your, your qubit from zero to one. What if you're a little bit off? Instead of applying a rotation around the angle pi, what you might actually have done is rotated by a small offset, let's call it epsilon, away from pi. If you look at a section of the block sphere from this side, here in the, the y and z axes, you notice how ideally we would have rotated the state along angles pi, but we have this extra little angle epsilon. And if you now imagine that we do this over and over and over again, you see how the error will begin to accumulate. And so this is exactly what a miscalibrated gate with amplitude error looks like. We'll use this to show that if we begin to now substitute this angle epsilon into our noisy uh, rotation, we can begin to break up the exponential into two pieces here, like this. And you notice that we have one piece x and another piece proportional to x. This is what we want, this is what we don't want. But because both pieces are both proportional to the same operator, the x operator in this case, it means that they commute, which means that we can treat this whole exponential classically as if it isn't a matrix, or in other words, these are commuting matrices. So we can simply break it up in two separate pieces, not having to worry about any cross terms as you normally do when you have matrices that don't commute inside the argument of an exponential. And you would recognize that each of those has the form of a rotation itself. In fact, you notice that our noisy rotation is equivalent to having a rotation that's what we wanted followed by a rotation that is unwanted, but very small and weak. This is a small little angle. And in fact, what we've just shown is that the rotation of the sum of two angles is just the product of those two rotations, one followed by the other. It's sort of intuitive, you knew that. If I rotate this much, then I wanna rotate this much, I just add the angles, and that's equivalent to one rotation of the sum of the two angles. 
So this is one type of noise that's very, very common, and you will see this for sure in your experiments. And we also see a new form where we can say, well, you know, the gate we wanted, here, let's zoom into this on a big picture, the gate we the gate we wanted, which is x, so this is what uh, ideally we would have seen, can be understood as having in practice an ideal part as well as a noisy part. So the gate we actually have, we'll call it x tilde, this is what we can use in practice, we don't have access to the ideal gate, we only have access to this noisy gate, can be decomposed into an ideal piece and a noisy piece. This is a very important concept that will show up in noise all the time, where we take what we have in the lab and we break it up into two pieces, one that we ideally want and one that we understand as the imperfection. Because when we can do that, then we can characterize and understand the noisy piece and begin to overcome it. Now, one common pitfall here is very common confusion I'd like to raise your awareness about is that the order of operations in quantum when it comes to unitaries and operators goes from right to left. So writing, oops, sorry, I wrote it backwards. In the circuit picture, see I get this confused too, in the circuit picture time flows from left to right. So in other words, um, you would, this picture means that you first applied the X gate followed by the Y gate. However, the way you would write that in the algebra is the opposite. You would write that this is equivalent to yx because these operations act on a state psi. So keep in mind that xy like this is equal to yx as a unit. So see, even I get confused all the time. Okay, let's get into using this noisy gate in our circuit and understanding how our experiment will differ from what we expected. Here's our evil monster Eve. She's come along and she's about to throw in with each of our sh surely ideal gates a non-ideal piece, which we'll write as x epsilon, that's sort of the error, the little over-rotation that we have. And instead of implementing our ideal circuit, we'll have to look at what our noisy circuit does. So in the ideal case, we would have started off with, well, there we go, let's try that again. In our ideal case, and, okay, there's the laser. In our ideal case, we would have started off with a bit flip that's generated by this rotation of an angle pi. In the noisy case, instead of applying that ideal gate, we apply the noisy gate which is either thought of as one rotation of the sum of two of, of an angle that's a little off, or equivalently we can think of it as the ideal rotation followed by some non-ideal, unknown to us, rotation. The total evolution of the entire circuit up here is taking that x gate and applying it d times. Well, we showed that earlier, we showed that that's either the identity or the x-gate, depending if d is even or odd. Another way to showcase it is that uh, we write down the rotation piece here instead, and we take and we apply that d times. Similarly, on the noisy side, we see that the total noisy unitary, denoted with this little tilde here, is just the application of the noisy gate d times. And in the language of rotations, that's simply these two rotations taken to the power of d. We've shown earlier that the product of these rotations is just summing the angles. So if you use that formula from earlier, you can decompose or write down that the total noise unitary is just our ideal unitary. You see that these two end up being the same, followed by an over-rotation of now not a small angle epsilon, but a much, much larger angle d epsilon. So notice that the error has accumulated because our noisy total unitary is now the product of 
our ideal unitary, the thing we wanted, times an over-rotation. But that over-rotation is no longer necessarily small for large integers d. In fact, how bad can it be? Let's go back to our original example. And here you will see in the ideal case, we showed that the expectation value of the z operator was minus 1 to the power of d. Now, having the picture of rotations in mind, we could also have written this as cosine of d times pi. Try to work that out yourself as well. And we saw this oscillation. However, now that we have this noisy gate, again, we just have rotations, we must actually have over-rotated, not by an angle of d pi, but by an angle of d pi plus d times epsilon. And the crucial point here is that we don't just have the noise, but the noise is going to add into the angle d. And so you can get this massively, massive buildup of the noise, because you'll notice that now, instead of the noise perturbing us a little bit, as a function of the depth of the circuit, the deeper you go, the more operations you do, the more the noise is going to build up, and in fact it's going to build up so much that at one point you're, not, you're going to get zero as your outcome instead of one or minus one. And if you go deep enough, you won't get one, you'll get minus one when you should have had one. So the thing we should have said is even is now odd. So this is why coherent noise is, is pretty tricky and something we like to avoid. But now we begin to also see and understand the picture we saw earlier having these kinds of oscillations. And this is very characteristic of coherent noise in general. Let's compare that picture on the right to our picture on the left. You see that the intercept point is at around the same place for both at around depth 30. And from that, we can sort of back out and estimate that our gate over rotation is around three, three degrees. So just a three degree over rotation on, on pi is going to produce this kind of buildup and error. So that's another way to also back up what you see in the device. Okay, how bad is it? Let's understand that. Well, coherent errors are probably one of the trickiest and maybe even worst in some sense. They're best because in principle you can correct them. It's just another unitary. If you knew what the right, if you knew that error, you could have just recalibrated your pulse. But if you don't know what it is, they sort of build up in the worst case scenario quadratically, too small, to first order. So if we take the difference between the expectation value of our noisy and our noise-free uh, wave functions, um, states, you can work out that, well, the Taylor series of cosine is one minus x squared over two. We're gonna look at this cosine up here. This is the result we want out of the system. And we're gonna look at just first order expansion of, of this. Oops. So if you expand this out, you notice that this is going to, and let's switch over to the pen. This is going to give us um, a proportionality that goes like d squared and epsilon squared. So it's a simple but general statement about the way that quadratic errors build up in a general quantum computation, even if you take an n qubit circuit. They tend to, we like to say, have this quadratic impact. And we'll compare and contrast that later to incoherent noise, which will tend to have only linear impact, linear in the error and, and the depth. So we'll get there, but keep that as a pin to come back to. So let's summarize. Coherent errors are ubiquitous. They can be described well by unitary operations. There was no quantum information lost in this whole process. We simply had the wrong evolution of the quantum state. The data shows typical signatures that look like oscillations because of this buildup. 
We don't see any kind of decays here. Of course, if you only looked at short times, you might think that that's a decay, but notice that it's not an exponential decay. If you really sort of look at it, it's, it's quadratic and then turns into this oscillation. And in fact, the algorithmic performance will be limited in a quadratic sense. So that kind of brings us to the summary of this simple toy model on one qubit. You might wonder what about multiple qubits when we have unwanted interactions. So there's some bonus content you can take a look at uh, where I work out this example of a very common noise on a two qubit uh, quantum processor. So that's for those of you who'd like to go a little bit further with this. Now is our first set of have fun questions. Um, so try answering these questions in, in the chat. And uh, let us know if coherent noise can be caused by A, B, or C. And if coherent noise can be really bad because of A, B, or C. So is coherent noise bad because of the loss of energy, miscalibrations, wanted couplings uh, to neighboring qubits? If you're watching the recording of this video, pause the video and try to answer. Okay, I hope you've taken time to pause and try this. So the answers are for number one, coherent noise is due to miscalibration. And for number two, coherent noise can be really bad because of this quadratic worst case performance. For those who want to take on a challenge and the path less taken, these are some more advanced questions to dive deeper and I'll hope to post the solutions to some time. All right, guys, we've made it to chapter three, measurements in quantum physics. And we'll introduce a fundamental source of noise known as projection noise in quantum. Why do we care about measurements? Well, it's how we get information out of a quantum computer. It's fundamentally different than classical measurements. You do very different things and they work in a different way. It's also where all the randomness in quantum comes from. So some people call it weirdness. There's a thing known as the measurement problem, which you may have heard of. Any results we want to get out of a quantum computer must pass through this interface of quantum to classical. And therefore, any noise in these measurements is unavoidably going to degrade what we care about. So let's get to know them to master them. Allow me to start with a zoomed out picture at first. Suppose that uh, you have a quantum system. Let's take our wanted den in life favorite cat, Schrodinger's kitten or cat. And uh, suppose this cat is in a superposition state of being dead and alive. Zero plus one. And that's okay as long as it's quantum. But as soon as you try to observe the cat, as soon as you try to measure the cat, as soon as you put it through this measurement apparatus, you're going to have to bridge the quantum to classical world. And that's going to leave the cat either dead or alive. And it's going to give you a piece of information that's classical saying it's either dead or it's alive. It's a bit, it's either zero or it's one. It's supposed to have an absolute definite value. So a little bit more to what we do with quantum computers on Instead of a cat, we generally talk about quantum wires that carry quantum registers, describing a quantum state psi that lives in a Hilbert space, H. And then as soon as we have this measurement apparatus here, we have to bridge into the classical world. And the outcome must be classical. So instead of one line, we depict classical wires and classical registers with uh, two lines. And they contain things like 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And that's what comes into your computer, and that's what you end up measuring at the end of the day and plotting. Now, the action of the meter was first described in its, in its modern version by von Neumann and Max Born. And we will cover the postulates more or less along the way that they set it up with a slight more modern version for our quantum setting. So we're going to look at measurements in the computational basis, 0, 1. The outcomes that we look at for a single qubit are going to be either 0 or 1. And we'll encode those in a classical 
bit x, capital X, to denote that x is a classical random variable. Since fundamentally quantum measurements are inherently going to have randomness in them. In fact, the way that they work is to say that with probability p um, given by this expression, we will measure the outcome zero. Notice that that probability depends on the state of the quantum system psi and its overlap with the pointer state or the reference measurement state zero that is the basis in which we measure. Similarly, for outcome one, we must have that the probability of that must be the overlap between the state psi, whatever that is coming in, and the one state, the reference state to which we want. So there's a classical outcome x equals one that is going to be randomly determined, but the probability of that randomness is dictated by the quantum state and its overlap with the meter uh, pointers zero and one. So let's, let's work through a little bit more of this to see what that all means. Now, pause the video, try this yourself. Show and prove that the sum of these two probabilities is one, because it has to be, right? So try to work it out, just show it yourself from the equations, no, seeing and knowing what you know here from the postulates that we have down here. Good, I hope you did. Here's if, how it works out. You can just substitute each of these up into these expressions, uh, expanding out what this absolute value means. It looks like that. You notice, uh, by the way, that this uh, function of, you know, bra zero, I'm sorry, cat zero, bra zero, uh, you can even factor out and write as a little operator. And in fact, if you combine zero, zero plus one, one, recall the matrices we looked at earlier, that's exactly going to give you the identity operator, which means that all we're looking at is the overlap between the state psi and itself, which is one, since the quantum state is always normalized to one. And so we've shown that all we're doing is a resolution of the identity into these probabilities. And that makes sense. And in fact, the entire classical distribution, which is over the outcome x and can have um, with value zero or one, must be dictated by a single classical parameter, we'll call p, the probability to measure one, itself determined from the quantum state according to this rule over here. And there are a couple of different ways to write this uh, probability that are all equivalent. So first, by this sign, I'll mean the classical probability to measure the classical random variable x in one which is essentially this bar down here. This means the expectation value of the operator one, one, which is essentially just the matrix zero, 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 one. And this is the overlap between the state psi and the state one. If we go back and look at how we resolve the identity, you notice that there is a a neat way to write this, which is to say that the probability to measure zero was related to this operator zero, zero. The probability to measure one was related to this operator one. So in matrix form, this is one, zero, zero, zero. And in matrix form, this is zero, 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 one, just to be explicit. So in general, Oops, let's go back and get our laser pointer going here. In uh, general, we can write down that the probability to have our outcome have a certain value lowercase x is the, inner, is the um, expectation value of this operator, which we'll call mu of x. These are related to some uh, probability operator measures. We won't need to mention any of that. Just think of them as projectors, operators. And we need to take their expectation values, which will then give us the probability of the outcome. There are several different interpretations here for the slightly more advanced folks. I'll mention these are inner products, they're overlaps. Later on, we'll introduce this trace notation. Don't worry about that for now. 
when you go on a second pass in this lecture and you've seen the incoherent section, you can come back to this. So let's look at how to um, actually understand what we will measure. The first thing we need to understand is what is the average value, the mean, of our classical outcome. And of course the mean, the classical mean, denoted here by E, the expectation value of the classical variable X is just the sum over all the possible outcomes it can have times the probability of that outcome. So pause the video, try to work out what this expression is both in the quantum sense and in the classical sense. Okay, I hope you tried it. If we just write this out explicitly, it's the value zero times the probability of having zero. Clearly that's just zero, so it doesn't matter. And then the value one times the probability of having one, which if you write out, we can see is that the expectation value of this random variable is just P, the probability to measure one. Now in terms of quantum operators, if we did the same calculation, pause the video and try it if you haven't, oops, then um, notice that the probability to have this classical variable X, we set as the expectation value of this observable mu. And because this uh, quantum expectation value is a, is a linear functional, you can move this constant X inside of the expectation value, it doesn't change anything. And likewise, it's a linear, so you can take the sum and move it inside of the expectation value. And so equivalently, this, the expectation value of our outcome X is actually the quantum expectation value of the quantum observable, sorry, the quantum observable, yes, or operator M, defined here like this. In our case, M is just the projector onto the one state, which looks like this. So this is this duality between the outcomes you measure and taking averages over them and relating them to the expectation values of a quantum operator. Great. Now, we know that means aren't everything. We also need to look at higher moments or we need to understand the noise around them. And to that end, pause the video and to calculate the variance of this classical random variable, the variance of this classical random variable denoted by this, bolt, uh, this V and defined in this way uh, in terms of the expectation values. It's the deviations around the mean. So pause the video and try to do this both for the classical and quantum. Okay, I hope you did. Now on the classical path, what uh, you will see is that you can, we already know the expectation value of X, we just need to know the expectation value of the square of it. Well, the square of a bit, the square of zero is zero, the square of one is one. So you end up getting the same thing, just as you did before. If you try to relate this to a quantum observable, you can show that the expectation value of this classical variable squared is actually in this case, just the expectation value of this operator squared. Maybe a footnote here. It's important that these operators you notice are defined in terms of the mu's, which are the computational basis states. In other words, all of these operators we're taking expectation values of here are, are going to be diagonal in the computational basis. So this is something to keep in mind um, by what we mean by M here. Now we can combine each of these results and the result from the previous slide and substitute them into the expression for the variance up above in order to find that when we put all this together, the variance of the classical variable X is related to the expectation value of the quantum operator M in this way. This is something you've probably seen in, in a different quantum class. And if we work it out in terms of the probability of the distribution that we had for the classical variable, parametrized by P, the probability to measure one, then effectively the variance is P times one minus P. So what does that actually mean and what does it represent? 
let's, let's take a pictorial look at this. Well, as a function of the probability, p, we can plot here the standard deviation as well as the variance of our classical random variable x and look at what those two look like. Notice that in the cases where the probability is 0 or 1, the standard deviation, the fluctuations around the mean, are 0. Because if the probability to measure 1 is 0, that must mean that deterministically, every time we do a measurement on the quantum state, we deterministically get 0 as the outcome. And if we get deterministic series of 0, 0, 0, 0, there's no variance, there's no fluctuations. Uh, notice that if the probability is 1 half, meaning that each time we measure our quantum state, we get 0 or 1 with equal probability, that's just a coin toss, 50-50, that means that the variance or the standard deviation is maximal. In this case, the standard deviation is a 1 half. Well, that tells us that, uh, in other words, the fair coin is the most unbiased thing you can do. It has the largest fluctuations around the mean. And as you deviate away from random to more deterministic on the edges of this uh, curve, your variance goes down. And it's important to point out that this is this kind of fluctuations or variance, this is intrinsic, inherent, and it's due to quantum physics itself. It's not an imperfection in the measurement. It's not an imperfection by any means. Rather, this is truly a feature of quantum physics. So we can't fundamentally get rid of it. So let's take a step back and summarize what measuring the qubit in the computational basis looks like. Well, we put in a state psi. We measure in the computational basis to get the outcomes 0 or 1 for the classical random variable x. Coming back to John's um, notation in terms of alphabets or sets, we denote capital sigma here as the set of possible outcomes. I'm going to introduce that notation because in a second we'll want to look at, well, what if you have n qubits, not just one qubit? And so the classical random variable x lives within the set of possible outcomes. In order to understand the probability distribution of that outcome, you want to understand what the measurement operators are um, for each outcome, which we understood as these projectors on the zero state and the one state. And then the probability to measure any of these outcomes is just given by the overlap between those projectors and the states you have uh, yourself. Um, here I've written this in a slightly more advanced form, introducing this notation known as, a, as the density matrix. Don't worry about that for now. It's going to be useful when we come to incoherent noise and introduce it more formally. But when you go back through these lectures, this will make more sense to, to know what that is. That's just there as a placeholder. To summarize, the outcomes we have for a qubit measurement for a single shot just one measurement, follow what is known as a Bernoulli distribution. This is what we've just shown. The name is Bernoulli. So x is distributed according to a Bernoulli distribution parametrized by the parameter p. The mean is the probability p. The variance is p times 1 minus p. That's, uh, that's going to come up a lot. And that p is determined by our overlap. Okay, great. I hope you got that. Please do post questions in the chat as we go along.